And so I think we could get started. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Larissa Brooks. I'm a librarian at the Ridge Public Library, and I am welcoming you to another program in our continuing sustainability series. In tonight's program, uh, Village Council member Pam Perrin will be uh, introducing the concept of uh, government energy aggregation. And even though I am a customer who gets government energy aggregated electricity in my home in Montclair, um, I am looking forward to understanding a little bit more about it tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Pam. Thanks, Larissa, and thanks to the Ridgewood Public Library for the sustainability series and having us as part of it. Um, welcome everybody. Have you ever asked yourself, what kind of world am I leaving to the next generation? What am I leaving to my grandchildren? With the climate crisis upon us, we do need to act. And the New Jersey Energy Master Plan aims for our state to use only 100% clean energy by 2050. Now, many people think that that's not fast enough and we have to act quicker and sooner. The task of fighting the climate crisis really falls on the shoulders of local government and individuals. Um, and tonight, we're going to describe a program that will spur our economy to create more renewable energy and, and have that renewable electricity come to customers in Ridgewood. It's called, as Larissa said, a renewable government energy aggregation, which is quite a mouthful. Um, I'd like to introduce the members of our panel First, the members of Green Ridgewood. This is a subcommittee of the Green Ridgewood Advisory Council to the Village Council, Advisory Committee to the Village Council. Uh, Beth Kreller has 16 years experience working in the oil and gas industry, analyzing risk, business controls, governance, and doing auditing. She now heads up an energy sustainability and energy risk analysis program. Christine Amundsen has a long career in the energy sector as well, and she now serves as the energy specialist for the Board of Education in Ridgewood. George Wolfson is one of the founders of Green Ridgewood, also a founder of the Shade Tree Commission and Earth Day in Ridgewood. Ken Jones is a member of the Glenrock Environmental Commission and one of the leading architects of the RGA in that town. And Larissa, of course, is our librarian and facilitator. And she's going to give us her perspective as a recipient of renewable energy. Um, we're going to have a PowerPoint presentation and we'll take your questions at the end. You'll find that we repeat concepts and that's intentional because it takes a while to grasp what this entity could be and, and the procedure that it takes. So first I'll define what an RGEA is. It is a third party electrical contract negotiated by the town uh, on behalf of the residents. So Ridgewood residents may have the opportunity to receive electricity at a discounted rate and encourage the use of renewable energy at the same time. And when they do so, and if they do so, there will be no disruption in the current uh, public service and uh, electric and gas supply from PSE and G. Um, and this has been done in many, many towns. First, it was, um, a, uh, it was just an aggregation of, of customers of energy. And then around 2009, um, it started being for renewable, for an enhanced renewable contra, uh, um, component of electrical energy. Um, it is 
created by statute. So our legislature created um, these aggregate, aggregation um, programs around the turn of the millennium. Um, that's when they deregulated uh, the, the, the supply. And uh, before that, you had no choice. You had to buy your electricity and gas from PSE and G. But now you can buy from a third party supplier. Um, the thing about it is it has to be an opt out program. So unless a resident elects to opt out of the program or is already with a third party supplier or for some other reason is ineligible, um, you're in, you're automatically in unless you opt out. Um, and um, the contracts generally run uh, no more than 24 months. And that's uh, due to certain risk factors. And also several towns can band together so that their aggregate customer base is bigger. And the bigger that base is, the more attractive it is to the third party suppliers and the more they'll compete with each other to get your business, the more they'll discount their rates. Um, and so I think we can go to the next slide and I turn it over now. I'll just say one more thing, the RGEA affects only supply and it does not affect delivery. And uh, Christine, I turn okay. it over to you. Okay, I'd like to add my, my input here. <clears throat> Having many years of experience with third party supply, both from a corporate stance and from a personal stance, <clears throat> renewable government energy aggregation, as Pam said, the only thing that it affects is the price of the supply. It does not affect the price of the delivery. No matter who your supplier is, you pay the same monthly service fee and delivery charges <clears throat> to PSE&G. We're talking about the supply portion of your bill, which is approximately 70% of your total cost is for the supply. 30% is the service charge and the delivery. <clears throat> what we also want to stress is that it does not affect the product you're receiving. The electricity is the same no matter who provides it. It comes through PSE and G lines. It's, there's no way of even discerning whether it's from an alternate supplier or PSE and G. So you do not have to worry that something's going to change. The only thing that's going to change is a line item on the bill. I think we could proceed to the next slide. Okay, <clears throat> now, electricity is fungible, no matter what the saw, source, excuse me, might say, what exactly does that mean? And that, again, is stressing the fact that electricity is a commodity and you can purchase it from PSE&G, you can purchase it from an alternate supplier, you can generate it from solar panels. So the electricity we're talking about is the supply you need in your home. Every month on the bill, you will see the charge is broken down. And we're going to show you that in the next slide. But again, the product is the same for all PSE&G customers. And you, you don't leave PSE&G. You still remain a PSE&G customer under the RGEA program. It's just the case we're talking about the supply. So let's look at the next slide, the next screen. This is an, an insert that you'll see PSE and G, some months they send the regular bill, other months they want you to go into great detail to explain what you're seeing on your bill and how you can look at those charges and understand them. These numbers are very hard to see and there's too much information on one sheet. So what we've done is on the next slide, we've taken a sample bill and we've really focused on the charges. And what you'll see is typical. If you had your own home bill in front of you right now, 
You'll always see your readings to see how much you've used in 29 or 30 or 31 days. You'll always see the service charge. Then based upon how much you use, you'll see the cost for the delivery. But now here we have the supply charges. This is what you might say to yourself, well, okay, why did they outline this in red? Because this is the area, the only area on your bill that would, you would see something different other than cost of electric supplied by PSENG. You might see cost of electric supplied by, I don't want to prejudice anybody, there's like 30 different suppliers you could get supply from, so I won't mention names. <laughs> but what you would see on your bill if you compared a current bill with one with the RGEA is in this section called supply charges, you would see cost of electric supplied by dot, 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 whomever the supplier is who's been the most competitive has offered the best price for the village of Ridgewood on this program. It would be a one line item. It would be a fixed price and it would be one price. Whereas PSE and G has two tiers and you know, a certain portion is 0.132383, a certain other portion is 0.141923. Going forward with RGEA, it would just be your total usage, which on this bill happened to be 756 kWh, and it would be at a six-figure price that's probably better than what you're looking at right now. KWh being kilowatts per hour? Yes, there you go. So the total cost there, $144.50. Again, 70% of that total cost is your delivery, and that does not change. And the other 70% is the supply cost. And that's where we're trying to save money and do it with a renewable standpoint. George, do we go to the next slide? Yep. Yep. So to put a little more emphasis on um, the basic way in which the program works. Um, basic generation service is, um, if you live in New Jersey uh, and you're purchasing your electricity supply through a utility like PSA and G, you are placed in a uh, default supply agreement, which is, which is referred to as the basic generation supply or you'll see here always BGS. That basic generation supply is actually created by the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities, which holds an auction, a BGS auction every year. And at that auction, electric supply companies compete to win the right to supply a portion of the forecasted load for the next year. The BPU will then determine a formula as to how they want to apply the different prices so as to limit the volatility of pricing. So for an example, um, the buyers are the utility companies, but they might work out a pricing arrangement where a third of the price is two years ago, another third is this year's, and the last third is the price that they're going to award the contracts for. That electricity is made up of, uh, purchased by the four utilities in New Jersey and is made up of energy suppliers within 13 states. It is a soup of electricity. It is, runs the full gamut from traditional surf, uh, sources um, like natural gas and coal but also some alternate energy sources as well on a limited basis. Uh, you will see on your bill a, a percentage uh, of how much is alternate energy. So the uh, BGS is a mandatory agreement um, unless an individual opts out through aggregation or a third party supply contract. Um, and it begs the question, which is better? One where the BPU sets the parameters or one configured and negotiated by the end user. The difference also in the aggregated service is that it will add part of the negotiation 
is to add additional alternate energy sources. Um, and this is done to, uh, through uh, the purchase of renewable energy certificates, which is something that alternate energy companies generate for every thousand hours that they produce. And then they're allowed to sell that on the open, in an open market condition to sort of level the playing field. So it gives, helps them uh, become more competitive with some of the standard bigger providers. If we go to the next screen. There we go. Basically, what we see here is the, uh, the basic generation supply. And then we have the REC negotiations and a purchase by the uh, governmental aggregation will give us a governmental aggregation price. That price in order to move forward needs to be lower than the basic generation price. So we're taking the basic price, adding more alternate energy to the, to the equation and coming out with a lower price than the BGA, sort of magic. If we go to the next screen, we see that if in fact our price is not lower than the basic BGS price, then we are under no obligation to proceed and go ahead. We can then wait till we can get a better deal or we can do nothing, but we at least know what's going on in the industry and have the opportunity to, to take uh, advantages of increasing our goal of more alternate energy at a lower price. Next screen. So here we have our friend over here, who's uh, what we call a gorilla in, in the room. And this gorilla is the what we call the automatic enrollment or the um, fact that it's a, uh, um, there's no opt-in um, to this. It's, a, it's almost, a, it's automatic. But there, and uh, there are exceptions. Uh, the exceptions are, first off, there's a 30 day period where anybody and everybody can opt out of the program. You can stay with whatever service you have at the moment. Uh, also, uh, it says automatic, but if you have a third party agreement already, in other words, you've responded to one of the flyers you received in the mail and have signed on with an aggregating company, uh, you are exempt. If you have direct service rooftop, you're exempt, you are opted out. Um, so, and if you just don't like it, you can, you will get a form which will uh, allow you to just say, no, thank you. There's no pressure to continue with the program, um, even though the town has signed up everybody to start out. So again, um, just to reiterate, to read the screen, um, you know, if you're already in a program, um, if you are basically with a third party supplier or have some kind of rooftop uh, or battery powered uh, powering house home, um, you will automatically be opted out. Uh, next screen. Again, you can opt out at any time. There is no penalty or fee for doing so. And there is no disruption of service if you do choose to do so. Uh, at the beginning of the project, all residents will receive an opt-out notification. All that's necessary is to return it and uh, that will be taken care of, you won't be in. Um, and as I say, uh, you can opt out at any time if that's the uh, cost you would like to see. Next screen. So what are the benefits? Why, why would this even interest us? And, and that's why we're here today. So I do wanna reiterate that none of us claim to be experts here, but we are all concerned residents. 
And as members of the Green Commission, we want to further the mission that Pam mentioned at the beginning of, of this discussion and, and what are we leaving behind um, for our future. When we think about our current state, we're not furthering that as actively as we could. And I think by being part of this government energy aggregation plan, it allows us to be a little more active in pursuing green energy alternatives for the future. Not only does it do that though, it gives us a fixed rate for a period of time. And the only way we're going to agree to this type of agreement is if we get a cheaper rate than what we're paying now. So we will have the ability and we're, we're using external consultants, which is no cost to the residents to really inform us what are the best prices out there. And we'll essentially give them a set of parameters. These are our expectations. We want green energy alternatives for the future, but we don't want it to be a, a cost disadvantage for us. We obviously want to maintain our current supply. So when we think about some of the benefits of being part of this type of program, we're going to have that, that scale, that buying power that Pam mentioned earlier. We have the full buy-in of the town, the bulk of the town, we're gonna to get a better price. This also allows investment in future green energy alternatives. Um, we can participate in an electric supply that is ultimately much more sustainable and hopefully we can secure some better terms. We'll have that buying power, like I said, of, of numerous residents in the town. And by having this contract in place, it's required that it's scrutinized, it's reviewed, and we'll, we'll be assured that we're getting the best terms and conditions possible for us as residents. So now I'd like to see what the actual experiences have been of our neighboring towns. And I'll turn it over to Ken Jones from Glen Rock. You're on mute, Ken. Oh, I'm mute. Thank you. So yes, uh, thanks, Pam. Um, Glen Rock actually started the process of um, looking into the, the GIA and the renewable government energy aggregation program four years ago, uh, almost four years ago this month, actually. Um, and um, we, you know, the council um, thought it was a good idea and uh, the environmental commission, which I'm a member, uh, went through a fairly elaborate process of education, um, such as what you know, we're doing right now, what, what Ridge was doing right now. Um, and um, eventually uh, we, we chose an energy consultant and the town um, passed the ordinance to establish the GIA uh, in uh, very early uh, 2018. So we, um, you know, we agreed upon what the specifications of the product should be. We were interested in at least 40% uh, uh, renewable electricity. So 40% from uh, renewable sources. Which Ken, we're, we're starting to lose you a little bit. We're located in our, uh, okay. Um, should have a good connection. Maybe I can just speak a little, a little slower. Can you hear me better now? There's a little bit of a delay between like your mouth moving and mm. words. Can't, I can't do much about that. Um, <laughs> if you, if you um, stop your video, you might get a better audio. Then you won't see me at all. Well, that's true, but so we might thinking? hear you. Okay, can do that. Um, do you hear me better now? Actually, that's great. Yeah. Thank you, Pam, that's a great idea. Okay, so sorry about that. Um, but um, so we also looked into the possibility for a 100% renewable product. Um, many thought that that would have a greater appeal. So actually our, we went out to bid and we bid on both products, a 40% product and a 100% product. Um, we 
went out to bid and, um, you know, it was a very exciting day opening up the bid uh, to see what we had. And it turns out that we did not have a winning bid. Um, so this is something every, you know, everybody needs to be aware of. Um, there will be ups and downs in the process. Um, and um, we decided based upon our you know, advice of our energy consultant to, to wait it out. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of what it comes down to in terms of getting a good bid, getting a competitive price has to do with just being there at the right time. Uh, there are certain times of the year that tend to, where the rates tend to be lower. Um, and so we, we, we bid again, I think it was the next fall. Uh, we, at that, that time we had actually one uh, bid that was under, but it really wasn't sufficient. We didn't feel like we would have enough savings. And so we actually went around, we, we went for a third bid in the spring of 2019. Um, we had a couple of bids at that point. Um, and we, we chose one that actually offered a 100% renewable product. It was 40% um, class one recs from our local region and the rest were, um, uh, was sourced through what's called the national grid, uh, which is, which is mostly wind uh, generated. And that was an 18 month contract. So that contract um, ended actually this, this, this past December, 2020. Um, you know, the, the process in terms, you know, from the residents point of view, uh, we had, you know, we started getting feedback, you know, right away, we had a town hall meeting, which was at that time, you know, in the days of a live event, um, we had about maybe 50 or 60 people that, for that. And we got to hear firsthand what some of the, you know, some of the, um, objections were and the main objection was was the opt-out and I think that's you know already been discussed here and that's understandable um, and you know the idea is this makes it very easy to do that in the end um, you know I think the the process is one that is uh, is the best we can do um, it does offer a great product and uh, in the end, I, I believe it was 70% of the residents of Glenrock participated in the program. And we had, you know, we did a calculation of the greenhouse gases uh, saved and it was quite substantial. Um, I think it was about a 10% reduction in our town's footprint. Um, so it really does have the benefits that we expect. It is, um, you know, rather simple to implement um, there will always be some people who will, you know, um, you know, wish there was a better way of doing it. Um, but at that point, at this point, really, we don't have another way uh, to reach those aims um, other than, you know, rooftop solar. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think the other thing to consider is the savings. Um, in the end, after the first uh, the first contract was over. Um, we did not quite save as much as we had hoped. Um, so that is something uh, to be aware of is that PSENG's prices go up and down every month. If you look at your bill, you'll notice that it tends to be higher in the summertime and tends to go down in the fall. And PSENG is always introducing what they call a reconciliation factor, uh, which will in theory, make it so that it evens out to equaling what basic generation service is. But it's a bit of a black box. Um, and uh, that, that particular, the duration of that contract, uh, I would say that we pretty much broke even um, for, that, for that particular one. But I think what people need to realize is that if you think about it, it is a renewable, um, it, it's a it's a green product. We all receive, um, you know, we all receive mail from all kinds of different energy companies promising clean electricity, which I'm sure they'll deliver. But at what price? And if you look at that price, either it's a three month price that looks really good and then it goes up, or 
It's just a high price in the first place. So PSENG offers their clean energy plan. But if you look at what that price is, uh, last time I looked, it was around 15 cents per kilowatt hour. And Glenrock's um, energy aggregation plan, which offered 100% renewable product, uh, offered it at 12.2 uh, cents per kilowatt hour. So if you compare it to any renewable plan out there, it's, it's far superior. It's a much better price. And that's really what it needs to be compared with, I think. Um, so, you know, there, there'll always be people who one month or another will say, oh gosh, I, you know, uh, PSENG price was lower. Well, it could be this month, but, you know, wait until the next month. Um, it's, you know, in the average, uh, it should, it should come out to either, um, you know, small savings would be great. Uh, but I think that we shouldn't necessarily have to insist upon that given that the quality of the product that, that we're getting is, is much better. So that's, um, that's, that's a summary from Glenrock. And I, and I should say that we, you know, we've, we've continued now with the, uh, the program, which I think that um, uh, one, you're gonna be talking about um, that from, from Montclair. So this is a program which involves um, six or seven towns in Essex and Glenrock decided to join that group. It's a, it's, an, it's a sort of super aggregation, which involves um, seven towns now, including Livingston, Montclair, uh, Maplewood, and some others. Maplewood serves as the lead agent. So they're the ones um, uh, signing off on the contract. All the towns agree on the parameters. And you know, the beauty of it is you really do get a better purchasing power. Uh, we think we did get a better deal this time around. Um, and I am looking forward to a little bit of savings. Um, so we'll, we'll see. So that contract will, um, will continue uh, through the summer of uh, 2022. We just started it actually. Well, so I can talk a little bit about what it's like from the consumer end of it. And um, it's pretty much not different at all. Um, so in Montclair, I noticed that um, when I read through the letter a little more carefully. So well, let, let me actually back up and uh, start from the beginning for what I remember, but you'll get a, a, a letter that looks, um, doesn't look like a bill, but it's from your um, town government. And it explains this concept that we're really learning about here. And um, I, must confess I didn't pay a huge amount of attention to it at the time because this, you know it was I didn't really have to do anything so um, this last round though I was paying more attention and I noticed that um, we had some it was on a, a local um, you know listserv that we had the chance to opt up um, to get full renewable and it was a slight fraction of a penny more per um, kilowatt per hour. And so it didn't seem like, sure, why not? Um, and I switched and seriously, there's, it's, it was pretty simple. Um, the only thing that made me nervous was that, I, I don't know if anyone's got, gotten calls from on those PSENG scams. It's just, you know, it just makes me more cautious um, because I wouldn't want to, you know, give out these numbers to anybody, but you just have to give the, um, the POD, I don't know if it's point of delivery or something like that number that's off of that bill and they'll walk you through it because some, you know, it's just like a mass of numbers on the back of that bill. Um, but it was really simple and I'm really happy that we do this um i don't know yeah there's no there's no change in anything um it's uh yeah it's been easy for uh, me as a resident uh, yeah there's no absolutely no difference and i'm glad that i mean i don't have any solar panels so i'm just glad that i can uh, just reduce my use of fossil fuels that way great beth you want to take the next slide me too. So, I mean, I do want to say, or I guess I should reiterate, we don't claim to be experts here, but we are residents. And I must admit, personally, when I first heard about these, these plans, I was a bit skeptical because we hear these big macro goals of, you know, the Paris Accords and regulations that are possibly happening at the federal level. But 
I mean, I really liked what Pam and I think Christine pointed out as well. Like, what do we do here locally? And I think this is an opportunity short of, you know, installing solar, installing geothermal on your home that you can contribute to green energy investment alternatives. Um, it seems pretty passive. It's, it's, uh, we're not seeing a wind farm going in our town by any means, but it, it's a way to contribute to green energy investments for our future. And I think overall, you know, you can, you can put your confidence in uh, Green Witchwood. Um, we want to make the right choice for our town. We don't want to have this be a, a value erosion decision. We want it to be a value opportunity for our town from a price consideration. And, and we will have specific terms and conditions for our town that will benefit the village. Um, we do want to have this fixed rate and, you know, kind of alluded to the peaks and valleys that you can experience. Um, just think about your bill right now. You know, if you're paying higher rates because it, it's costing more to heat or cool your home with, with temperatures going up and down, this will allow us to have that fixed rate um, for a period of time. Um, again, it encourages the green energy investment. There is no disruption to your current bill. Um, there's no obligation or fees for this consultant that we were used. So we touched on that a bit, but we will use an outside consultant that's an expert and uh, there is no obligation uh, to this consultant to find out more. And there are no penalties for opting out at any time. I think the, the next slide belongs to you, Pam. Okay. Um, so what we need to do is uh, the village council would have to hear from residents that they're interested in this arrangement. And the council would then pass an ordinance to create a renewable government energy aggregation. And then Green Ridgewood would for the would advise the council for their for their understanding um, what requirements we would want the contract to have. Uh, what kind of preferred rate? What would be the price range we're looking for? Uh, do we want 18 months? Do we want 24 months? Some contracts are only 12 months. Um, I don't think I'd want that. This is a lot of work for just 12 months. Um, and then what percentage of energy supply uh, of renewables do you want? Do you want 100%? Do you want 40%? Do you want only 10%? Um, and what, what class of regs do you want, uh, of recs do you want? Um, and so those parameters will give the consultant an idea of where to look in the market. So we select an energy consultant. And um, Ken was kind enough to give me his uh, matrix that they used in, in Glen Rock to interview the consultants. Um, uh, what's your experience with this and, and how would you handle such and such a situation? And with the energy consultant, the, the town prepares a game plan to approach the supplier market. And um, you provide, uh, the, the consultant provides all the administrative requirements such as outreach, customer service, they answer everybody's questions, they suggest the timing, um, they, they give you the, the little uh, card that gets mailed to every house, telling the, giving the residents notice, we're going to be doing this program, here's when you can opt out and how to do it. Um, they will approach the marketplace for you, for, for the town, with the terms and conditions that the village requires. The, um, the consultant is paid by the supplier. So when we get a price, of course, that's built into um, the price. So you could say in effect, we're paying for it, but not directly. Um, the village has no um, particular liability and neither do the residents. So. Um, we don't have to um, worry about lawsuits and we don't have to pay the, the consultant directly. Um, so I guess we go to our next slide. And we welcome your questions at this point. 
I, I see that Anne has a question. Anne has a very good question. Yeah. Anne asks, why would anybody opt out? Um, Ken, you probably had a lot of uh, um, different answers for that question. Yeah, um, I would say most of the people who opted out uh, simply felt that um, this was something that was being imposed upon them and they didn't like it. Um, you know, we, we have a, um, a very active social media network in Glenrock um, and we, we monitored that. Uh, so I have a pretty good idea actually and, um, you know, we, we tried to explain to folks uh, why, you know, really you're not getting any choice by staying with, with uh, PSCNG. I think George explained that very well. Um, you know, the analogy I like to have is, you know, when you um, move to town, um, you know, you, you're signed up to PSCNG and that's it, boom. You're not told about alternatives, but you know when you want to get your cell phone, there's all kinds of alternatives out there, right? There's, there's competition. You can choose, and this really gives you that opportunity. Um, but you know, it's it is it's something that is is an individual, um, you know, preference. Some people, um, you know, there, there were people who um, I think were just never quite convinced that. Um, the service would be the same. There were a lot of rumors um, about, you know, what would happen uh, to, to the delivery. And, you know, that's just simply not true. I mean, anybody would know. I mean, people, people have had third party providers for decades now, right? Ever since we had um, the um, you know, deregulation. And I've never heard that somebody who's, you know, on a third party provider didn't have their, uh, their power restored when, when a tree fell in their neighborhood. It just, it just doesn't, it's just silly. But, you know, th these things persist. Um, and I think the best, you know, the best antidote is, is doing what we're doing now, you know, uh, clear communication, uh, well, uh, you know, well-formed information uh, coming from, you know, good sources. Um, and I think that, you know, that will go a long ways. Do we have another question? This uh, is from Kim Wong. Is there a percentage of residents that needs to be in the program to make it worthwhile? Um, I think you start the contract and you're at a high, right? And then it can, the percentage of participation changes as people move away because this contract doesn't pull in the new, the people who have moved in. And so right. you do have a natural attrition and mm -hmm. that's a good reason why the contracts are pretty short. Um, so, but I, I have not heard of any um, minimum number of participants, participants have you guys? No. But that's a good question. No. We no, have heard the size of our town is very large. Like we wouldn't have to partner with another town to even get a fair price in the market. So, I mean, I think that's, and, and I mean, that's AD, what we've heard. The energy companies that will bid, they know full well. They know the contract. They've seen it. They know that residents can opt out. So this is just a risk they take. They they factor all this in. And they know that on average in New Jersey, about 15% of residents will opt out, maybe 20%. So they factor that in. You know, they know what the load is that Glen, that Glen Rock or Ridgewood have. Um, and they, you know, they'll just knock 20% off of that and they'll, and they'll put it out to bid. Um, so that, you know, they do all those calculations. It's nothing, nothing to worry about. And um, one of those key elements in the calculation, I think, is the usage number, which we don't get unless we hire a consultant. Am I right about that? 
Well, so at the moment, the beauty is once Ridgewood um, passes the ordinance, that allows Ridgewood, that gives Ridgewood the legal authority to aggregate and essentially give the usage, aggregate usage of all residents to the agent and to you for the purposes of bidding. You need that number, whatever that number is, you know, hundreds of thousands of kilowatt hours or a megawatt hour. It's gonna be, it's gonna be on the order of a few megawatt hours as it is for Glenrock um, because that's what they used to bid with. So that's, that's, um, that's, that's, how you, that's, that's how that's known. And that's why that the ordinance needs to be passed because that's part of the, that's part of the, um, of, of the legal framework for allowing this to happen. We have another question from Ellie Gruber. She says, we signed up with a wind supplier for part of our PSE&G bill under a previous New Jersey program. How do we then transfer to an RGEA program? Um, I think it term depends on the terms of your contract, Ellie. Um, does it allow you to terminate early? And are there penalties um, attended upon that? So you would probably uh, um, want to look at that first. So I think yeah. for people who have solar panels, they really should look at, before they join an RGEA, they would really want to look at the benefits that they're already getting and compare those to the RGEA. I believe that does come down to the terms of the contract, their existing contract. Uh, some contracts will allow people to, opt to, to phase out, others will make you stay for the full term of the contract. And that's an individual arrangement that you've already committed to. So I think that's the answer there. But one thing to be aware of is that that's, you know, let's say your contract uh, runs out uh, after six months and you're, you're actually then able to join Ridgewood's program at that point, because you can also opt in whenever you want. Don't forget, you can we emphasize the opting out whenever you want, but you can also opt in whenever you want, which is just as important. Rurik asks, how do you know the source of your renewable energy? George? As far as the renewable piece is concerned, that's how you negotiate uh, the, uh, um, the, the price. You are, just as Ken had pointed out, they were negotiating with a component of the uh, a wind uh, facility probably off of Massachusetts, if it's the right uh, company I'm thinking of. So that's how you would know, uh, basically how you, who you hire to be your uh, uh, third party supplier will tell you basically. But there's the whole question of um, what you're really doing is, is putting a larger wind component in that case into the bigger pool. Remember that once it hits the lines, it's all the same. So what you're doing, you're taking credit as a town for doing it, or maybe counting your, your carbon footprint, but you're actually contributing that into the bigger pool, as Christina pointed out before. It's, it's funding that, you know, you know specifically who you're paying it to, but it's not coming to your house. It's basically going into the bigger pool that public that PSE and G is using, and so it's the flexibility that you have to be have more uh, um, companies that have alternate energy into their into their pool, selling you know giving it to uh, providing it to PSE and G. That's where where you see the increase in alternative energy. It's not specifically that X supplier is coming to your house. It's basically that you're contributing a larger pool. And so you are helping to grow the goals that the state has put out like 50% by 2030 or 100% by, by 2050. That's kind of how you get to the advancement of 
alternate energy into the process. But it's never that X wind farm is providing it and it's coming to your house. It's going into the mix. Think of it as a soup. So I find that a very hard concept to, to hold on to, that you're stimulating the build out of the local renewable industry. It's, it's a little abstract for me, but okay. Um, it's a little abstract for all of us. And this is, there's things to learn yet. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a growth industry. So part of what's going on is as we get involved with the consultants and as we get involved with the industry, we will learn more and more about different ways to increase that, which will ultimately get us more deliverables to our sites. Uh, the Montclair site is a great example of that. You have a basic number uh, that you contracted for, and then on top of you know, and then on top of that, you put together a program which allowed people that really want to see that advance faster pay the extra half a penny or whatever the, the number is each month to make that happen quicker. And mm -hmm. that's where the concept is, where the kind of the rubber meets the road. It's not that you're producing something and it's coming to your house. It's that you're expanding the size of the pool, also putting more water into it. So that's the way you kind of have to look at it rather than, uh, you know, we, we specifically try to stay away from the, the verbiage, the wording that says you're buying green energy. You're, you're creating a bigger network of green energy coming through your system, coming through your filter. Um, and that's kind of the way we see it. Um, so I would like to add, I would like to add something that we know, uh, especially Green Ridgewood knows, we're very proud of the fact that we were able to reach a silver level of sustainable certification. And now it's important that we maintain that. We can't just relax. And one of these reasons we were interested in this program is because Sustainable Jersey for municipalities supports this also and encourages it. And there are, there are different classes of the renewable energy certificates. I believe class one is solar, but we, we, as George said, and, and Pam and, and Beth and Ken all know, we're going to, it's a learning process and we're trying to escort the village uh, as we go along too. We're going to get a good consultant and they'll educate us also. I think we saw some questions about social media and talking to your neighbors, which is great practical questions. And I, I think um, Glenrock did a really good job of that kind of 101. What are the basics? And we can learn from, you know, we're, we're not the first to do this. A lot of our neighbors have done this. And so we can learn from their educational experiences and, and we, Green Ridgewood can get better about educating our neighbors. You know, and we do have social, we have Instagram, we have Facebook, we can use those outlets. We have a website. We could post more, you know, bite-sized information about what, what's the basic 101 here. I think I really like Christine's point though. I mean, we, we wanna maintain our designation, not just to maintain it, but because it, it's good for our town. You know, we've done so much around EVs, for instance, and I see them, there's several on my block where I live, but when you're, if you're, if, unless you have solar on your house or geothermal in your house, you're plugging in just like you plug in everything else. And where is that electricity coming from? It's coming from the grid, you know? And, and so these types of projects or, or these types of, of, of contracts are gonna allow us to invest in those types of projects so that our grid is getting greener which is what we desperately need. And um, again, it's, it's this nebulous concept, it's passive. You're not plugging in and having a wind farm power your house. Um, it, is, it is the pool, right? That we're, we're trying to create a, a greener pool out there. But I do think we can get better about educating folks and I appreciate those comments. If, if I could just add, says, oh, I'm sorry, go on, Ken. If I could just add, there's a fantastic, if, for, if you wanna know something about the technical aspects of our grid, and the sources of, of, of generation that go to make our electricity, electricity comes to, comes to all of our houses, go to pjm.com. It's actually amazing. And they have a pie chart, which is live, and it's updated maybe every few minutes, I don't know. And it will show you exactly 
the breakdown. So currently, you know, I'm looking at it right now. Um, and as we've been speaking, the renewable portion has gone down from about nine to eight megawatts. Why is that? Well, because the sun is setting in, Oklahoma, in, in Ohio and Indiana, where there's a lot of wind farm, where there's a lot of wind and there's a lot of solar, more importantly. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and in the morning, it comes back up again. It's, it's, it's really interesting. But it also shows you, you know, we've got a significant amount of coal, about 20% um, about, uh, is coal in this region. Um, and this is, the, this is the reason why it's highly recommended. Sustainable Jersey recommends it. I know your energy consultant will recommend it to go for class one recs that are exchanged within the PJM region. And the reason for this is that it is our region. It is our local region. Our wind comes from west to east and what's west of us are some coal, lots of coal and natural gas plants. We would like to convert those to solar and wind. Uh, when, we, when, we, when the town does a, 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 an RGA, we're sending a strong signal that we are supporting that. Um, and the class one simply means that it, they're truly renewable. They are mainly, it's, um, it's solar, uh, wind, and, and uh, hydroelectric. Pat Pechko at, says, I'm a regular renewable energy shopper and I'm excited about this effort. I can attest to the fact that the switch to third-party providers is seamless. How do you suggest we communicate the value of this program to our neighbors? Well, Pat, there are lots of ways, I guess. You could start with a letter to the editor. I think you're in a good position for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and let's see, is, if Jeannie is still on the line, there's Ridwood Talks. Uh, you know, I wanted to actually jump in on this one because I think that um, the face-to-face -face or not necessarily, or just this direct uh, conversation like that was, or programs like this, and also just hearing from your neighbors and talking to your neighbors. I mean, that's what got me to opt up to 100%. I mean, even though I understand much, much better now, George, what that really means, but it really, I, I, there's really nothing better than that kind of um, personal contact too, but the, that letters to the editor and then, um, yeah, just the, the inform is sharing information like that. And then of course, posting in on social media, but there is something really nice about, I read, a, a, it was a message from um, someone I don't even know is just talking about it. And I thought, oh, that sounds great. And I, I have one other point that just came to my mind. The village of Ridgewood uses an alternate supplier. Mm -hmm. Just so, you know, people would know they're not getting their supply from PSE and G. Yeah, we already use a third party supplier. So, and we have for years, I think. Um, so we're in, in, in a municipality's aggregation and that's just for the municipality's buildings and facility. Right, right. It does not include residents. It's not like this, this program that we're talking about here. And then of course, the other thing, Pat, is come talk to the council. Come to a council meeting and let them know that you think this has value because um, we've presented twice to the council and they are not at the point of passing an ordinance. So they need to hear from residents if this is going to happen. Um, any other uh, um, outreach and educational things that you tried in, in Glenrock, Ken? Uh, we, did, we did actually um, record a webinar um, and that went around, uh, you know, social media. So that can be, that can be useful. Uh, we also prepared a, an FAQ, um, frequently asked questions. And I think that was also very helpful to be able to refer to. So we all have a consistent, um, you know, body of information that we can share. We had both the short version and the long version. Um, the long version was, uh, got kind of technical. Um, but for example, um, we, you know, we worked out with our consultant to get a, a 
fairly crisp description of how recs work. Uh, that took a lot of work to do. It, we boiled it down to maybe a page. Um, and, uh, you know, happy to share that with you. I, I may have already, but I've shared it with many towns. Um, our, our FAQ, I know that the, the folks in Essex County were very thankful for it. Um, uh, we shared it way back with, when they had their first contract. Um, so that's also helpful. Would you suggest that we calculate um, our village's carbon footprint so that we have mm -hmm. a baseline for measurement later? Yep, that's a great, a great idea. Not so easy to do. No, it's but, not. Um, yeah, you may, able to, you may be able to get PSJ and G to help you with that. Because um, if it's anything like Glenrock, we, we have many different accounts and it's hard to to pull all those up, pull all those together. Because people often say, well, how do you, what's your, what's your measurable result? And we need to be able to show something. I think that's where the consultant will also come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we, he actually did calculate it for us and that's the number I gave you uh, was from the consultant. Um, they were able to, uh, and you don't need to do the foot carbon footprint for that. There are kind of formulas that you can that you can pull out. So at least knowing what the residential footprint is, for example, um, mm -hmm. you can then calculate it pretty quickly. You know, it's harder to pull in all the other pieces, the commercial part and the municipal part. Um, but um, at least you can start with that. <clears throat> Uh, what about businesses, uh, Bob Upton asks. And um, I think initially what most towns do is they go for the residential. And the, the regulations do allow for commercial as well, but um, I think the consultants are steering towns away from that. I don't fully know why. Um, well, I think it's because there's a residential rate and there's a commercial rate. So he put away from the B, uh, BGS formula into a couple of other different pricing schemes. Mm -hmm. Different which, rates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and George, how would you account for businesses opening and closing? Do you think, does that affect it as well? Well, I think that's another reason they keep it out so that they don't have to, to deal with that flexibility and volatility. Um, <clears throat> I think that you can calculate your footprint on a kind of a replacement basis where you say, okay, if I am uh, know that I've uh, purchased regs that are wind-based um, or solar-based, I just compare that against an average of uh, what I've replaced in terms of the standard uh, um, uh, EGS component. And so that, that gives me that delta that I can compare and say, well, I don't know exactly what it is, but I know I've improved it by X. So that's one way to look at it as well. There's one last question, but I don't quite understand it. Uh, from Kim Wong, um, then will the monthly fee go up? I'm not sure what that's referring to. So I, I, I think I maybe that referenced a que the, this person's questions earlier about uh, people dropping out. Like if, if there's some maximum or minimum number, maybe does the the ever increase. I can't imagine that it would because you have a fixed rate and that's a risk that the supplier just took. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no fee, like there's not, you don't pay a fee to get electricity this way. I mean, you just pay for the electricity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unless she's referring to the delivery charge, but that's determined by PSENG and that is um, the same for all customers. Um, we had a couple. Oh, go ahead, Pam. Are there more questions? No, but there were a couple of things in the chat. I think that um, would uh, that I'd like to bring up too. Um, and okay, no, I can't see this. Um, somebody was wondering about um, the. Oh, are there any other informational events planned, um, or are you distributing the information through other avenues? 
for example, Facebook, or what if people wanted to find out more about the Ridge, this Ridgewood specific um, endeavor, where could they go? Uh, we, we want to set up something on Facebook, Beth. No, I think you know I, I'd love to you know repurpose some of Glenrock's learnings if we can, if they don't mind sharing. And um, yeah, we we have a Green Ridgewood Facebook page. Um, we have a Green Ridgewood Instagram account, and then um, we also have our own web page. If you don't do social, which I can appreciate if you don't. Um, we, we have other channels. So I think it's, yeah, and it's getting creative and talking to our neighbors is what's going to get the word out. And pretty Does, soon we might be able to meet in person, which I find such an exciting idea. <laughs> so what I about the town soon. Ridgewood town web page? Um, does, or is that what you're talking about for the green Bridge with the um, that's green yeah we have subject. like a sub page off of the you know, town yeah that's what I was referring to yeah so hopefully yeah. people can find us that way but yeah any learnings you can offer for getting the word out yeah we can we'll <laughs> sure yeah well, we did rely you. heavily on on Facebook but I wish I wish there were other avenues letters to the editor are also great yeah uh, so. Thank you to all our participants. Every time I talk about this topic, I learn something new. And uh, thank you to all the guests who came, all 34 of you. Uh, I hope you learned something too. Don't hesitate to contact any of us with questions you may have. Uh, my email address is on the Village website, pperrin at ridgewoodnj.net. And uh, Christine is at the Board of Ed. And Larissa is at the at the library. Mm -hmm. So we monitor messages on social too. So if you just find us on social, we can get back to people. Mm -hmm. Whoever thought something with the name like government energy aggregation could be so interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but All thank right. you very much. This is I really learned a lot too about what I've been agreeing to do for the last <laughs> four years. <laughs> thank, thank you for hosting. Thank you very yes. much, everyone. Have a nice Good night, night, everybody. And oh, by the way, this recording will be available on the library's um, website on our um, sustainable uh, sustainability series YouTube channel. So I need a, just a little time to process it, but then I'll be able to upload it soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.